Working on ships had always been routine for me. Spending months at sea unloading and loading containers, sailing through the most unusual waters. I love the sea. The wind blowing vigorously on your face. Nothing human for miles on end, just you, the swaying of the waves and occasionally some animals. Although I must admit one thing that always made me somewhat uneasy were the dark nights at sea. Where, depending on the time of year, we couldn't see the moon and sometimes, not even the stars clearly. It was on one of those dark nights in the middle of the open ocean that I experienced something that changed my life. It was around 2022 when our ship was arriving at a small commercial port in China. Night was falling heavily upon us, shrouding everything in deep darkness. The wind was howling through the ropes and the waves were crashing against the hull of the ship with a deafening roar. I was on duty at that moment, helping to maneuver the containers off the deck. The crew was tense but we kept our focus on our tasks. A thick fog began to form in the harbor men responsible for the instructions that we received. If I remember correctly, his name was Wang, started murmuring something. I don't have much proficiency in Chinese, just the very basic, so I got lost in his words, asking him to repeat. I only understood two words of what he said. Be careful. I paused for a moment, thinking about it. Thinking of saying something else, but the captain urgently called us back to the ship. We were going to leave before that terrible storm formed. I looked back as we departed and Wang's worried look still lingered on his face as he disappeared into the fog. As we moved away from the port, the ocean breeze seemed to thicken, enveloping the ship in a chilly embrace. The sounds of the sea became muffled and distorted, as if we were sailing through a tunnel. Some birds chirping distorted cries and waves crashing all around. Alright guys, I'm off to bed. I muttered before the weather got even worse. It wasn't my watch night that day, so I wanted to make the most of a full sleep. I dragged myself to my cabin, feeling fatigue weighing on my limbs as the ship gently swayed beneath my feet. The fog outside seemed to seep into even the darkest corners of the vessel creating an uncomfortable atmosphere that left me restless. I threw myself on the bed, trying to ignore the muffled sounds coming from the deck. But the more I tried to push away these somber thoughts, the more they seemed to take root in my mind. What had that been with Wayne today? Did I mistranslate? Either way, I felt bad, unlucky, with a bitter taste in my mouth. I fell asleep in a heavy sleep, immersed in the darkness of the cabin. I'm not exactly sure how long it was when I woke up, along with the rest of the crew. Tim, the guy who stood guard that night, was banging frantically on my door, his face pale and his eyes wide open. Wake up, man, you need to see this, he exclaimed, voice trembling. Confused and still sleepy, I got up and followed Tim to the deck, where the other crew members were gathered in a confused silence, looking at something ahead of the ship. Some seemed to be searching for something and others were irritated. As we emerged onto the deck, I was immediately hit by the cold, damp night air. The thick fog enveloped everything, obscuring our vision completely. I joined the other crew members trying to glimpse what had caught everybody's attention. So, Mr. Timothy, what did you want to show? Old Joe asked, more grumpily than usual. I saw something like a submarine or a missile. It was big, gray, and we were heading straight for it. Tim exclaimed, his voice trembling. The voices began to murmur after the last sentence. Quiet. The captain said, his firm voice immediately silencing everyone. The captain grabbed his binoculars and scanned the horizon, frowning with concern. A tense silence hung over the deck as we awaited his assessment. I don't see anything up there, Tim. You may have been mistaken, the captain finally said, passing the binoculars to the next crew member. 
but before we could finish, a distant sound echoed through the fog. It was a low, almost imperceptible noise, but enough to send a shiver down everybody's spine. What the heck was that? Somebody asked, their voice tinged with fear. Ahead of us in the foggy darkness, something moved slowly in the water. At first, it was just an indistinct shadow, but as our eyes adjusted to the darkness, the shape became clearer. A wave of nervous murmuring swept through the group as we watched, hypnotized, the apparition before us. It was a whale, a colossal creature emerging from the fog like a sea ghost. Its massive body rose from the depths, its dark gray skin faintly shimmering in the dim moonlight. It let out an immense roar, and we saw its head emerging from the water, and it was huge. By the shape, I would say that it was a sperm whale. Yeah, I know they're not whales, but that's beside the point. The imposing presence of the sperm whale seemed to fill the space around us, filling us with a sense of insignificance in the face of the vastness of the ocean. Its penetrating gaze affixed on us, as if studying us minutely. Silence fell over the deck as we all watched the creature with a mixture of fascination and fear. The sound of the sea seemed muffled, as if the ocean itself was holding its breath and the face of the whale's majesty. Suddenly, it plunged back into the depths, disappearing into the darkness. A collective sigh escaped from the lips of the crew, but the tension still hung in the air. What was that? The first mate said, low and beside the captain. The captain remained silent for a moment before replying, his expression serious and worried. I'm not sure, he whispered, but something tells me we shouldn't be here. Suddenly he turned, speaking loudly and with a slight smile on his face. I thank Mr. Tim for giving us this breathtaking view, but if he only called us here to watch marine mammals, I believe my sleep is more important. And so the crowd dispersed and I, in the same way, returned to my dreams and to my warm blanket. As I tossed and turned in bed unable to find comfort, images of the whale continued to haunt my thoughts. I wondered what could have brought that magnificent creature from the depths so close to our ship. Finally, exhausted by the turbulence of my thoughts, I succumbed to fatigue and plunged into a fitful sleep. Strange and disturbing dreams haunted my mind, filled with distorted images of dark waters, sharp teeth, endless tentacles. I struggled in the depths of a stormy sea, fighting against invisible currents and something very large. When I finally woke up, the sun was already rising in the sky, dissipating the last traces of the night. As I groggily got out of bed, a persistent feeling of unease remained within me, like a shadow refusing to completely dissipate. I couldn't pay attention to those thoughts. I dressed appropriately and went up the ship, ready for another day of labor. As I worked, I noticed the atmosphere on board had subtly changed since the incident the night before. The crew seemed more cautious, their eyes constantly scanning the horizon for any sign of movement. Conversations and whispered murmurs across the deck, speculations about something strange happening, nightmares. The captain, meanwhile, remained reserved and taciturn, his serious face revealing little of his internal thoughts. He steered the ship with the firm hand as always, but there was a noticeable tension in his posture, as if he were fighting against some dark omen that had haunted him since the previous night. I noticed his sunken eyes, he probably hadn't slept well either. As the day slowly progressed, a sense of apprehension settled over the ship gradually, much like the heavy fog that began to hang over the sea. Finally, we ended our shaft, and the whistle sounded inviting us to the mess hall to feed us with a warm meal before resting for the next journey. The crew gathered around the tables, sharing meals and conversations in an effort to ward off the weight of what had happened the previous night. 
However, even with food and camaraderie, the tension persisted in the air. Conversations were punctuated by nervous glances out the windows, as if they expected to see something emerging from the fog at any moment. I too felt restless, unable to shake off the worry from my mind. After dinner, I returned to my cabin, determined to rest a bit before the next shaft. But as I lay in bed, the feeling of unease only seemed to grow. I knew I wouldn't be able to relax. I decided to start my watch earlier, and Tim, who was on before me, seemed very grateful to leave from there. The night was dense and humid as the fog enveloped us, small water droplets condensing on the surface of the ship like a cold sweat. I climbed to the deck, taking in deep breaths of the salty sea air. The darkness was almost palpable, engulfing the ship in an oppressive embrace. I advanced cautiously, my senses sharpened by the sense of alertness that hung over us. The wind whispered a faint whistle as I walked across the deck, my steps echoing in the stillness of the night. The fog clung to the lamps, turning their light flickering, casting distorted shadows that danced around me. Every sound was amplified in the darkness, echoing like a silent omen. I noticed a solitary figure standing at the bow, gazing at the horizon with an almost tangible intensity. It was the captain, his silhouette outlined against the dark sky. I walked towards him, feeling a shiver run down my spine. Captain, I called, my voice sounding small and weak in the vastness of the night. He turned to face me, his tired eyes reflecting the dim light of one of the spotlights. No, oh, it's you, he said, his voice laden with concern. I thought it was Tim Shift. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to switch with them. Is everything all right, Captain? I asked, feeling a knot of anxiety form in my stomach. He sighed, running a hand over his wary face. No, it's not, he admitted. There's something wrong about this night. I can feel it in my gut. I joined him at the bow, looking out at the dark horizon before us. What do you think's happening, Captain? I asked, my voice barely audible over the roar of the sea. He shook his head, his expression grim. I'm not sure, he confessed, but something tells me that it's not good. His voice lowered. There's something following us. I could see it on the radar, it's been like this since we set sail. A chill ran down my spine at his words, a sense of fear settling in my chest. The captain's confirmation only heightened my unease. I looked at the thick fog surrounding the ship, imagining what could be hidden within those sinister shadows. A feeling of paranoia began to creep over me. What should we do then, captain? Is it that whale we saw? I asked my voice trembling with growing anxiety as I remembered that strange encounter. He fell silent for a moment, his eyes fixed on the horizon. For now, just stay vigilant. Keep your eyes and ears open. If something happens, everybody must be ready to act. I nodded. Together, we stood at the bow of the ship, watching the dark sea before us, every shadow and movement scrutinized with growing attention. Time seemed to drag on as we waited, tension mounting with each passing moment. Suddenly, a sound echoed through the fog, a low guttural sound that made my heart freeze in my chest. I looked at the captain, seeing the reflection of my own fear in his eyes. It was the same sound we heard from the night before. Soon, the first mate came. Captain, something is approaching the ship and fast. The captain raised an eyebrow, his face tense with worry. Prepare for whatever comes, he ordered, his voice firm. All men to their posts, be ready for any eventuality. The crew moved quickly, their faces tense as they prepared for whatever was about to come. I joined my colleagues, my heart pounding in my chest, as I tried to maintain composure in the face of the growing sense of imminent danger. The fog around us seemed to become even denser, enveloping the ship in a cold and oppressive embrace. 
the sounds of the sea distorted, turning into indistinct murmurs that echoed in the darkness. I realized that the environment was becoming turbulent, the water shaking and foaming, and then we saw in the distance a large wave coming towards us. What is this? I tried to ask, but my voice wouldn't come out. I started to tremble, frozen before it, feeling like nothing, empty, and I swear to God that I almost wet myself right there. The wave was over four times bigger than the ship. It seemed to almost swallow us, but that wasn't the worst part. No, a lightning bolt struck in the distance in the ocean, its light dissipating towards us and I could see inside the wave the colossal shadow of the whale moving at a surprising speed. Its size was impressive, its massive body cutting through the water with ease, leaving behind a trail of foam and vapor. A sense of panic took hold of me as I watched that creature, its imposing presence filling the space around us with an aura of power and majesty. The crew rushed to their stations, preparing to face whatever was about to come. The captain remained on deck, his expression stoic as he commanded the men to their positions. The deafening sound of the approaching wave echoed through the deck, a powerful roar reverberating in my ears. Brace for impact, shouted the captain, his voice lost in the cacophony of the ocean. I held on tight, my heart beating uncontrollably as the wave approached closer and closer. The colossal wave loomed over us like an imminent threat passing over the vessel. I could see the huge body of the whale above us, my heart hammering as if it was about to burst out of my chest. I thought it was the end, but it wasn't. The creature fell on the other side of the boat, the thunder almost deafening us, as a mass of water tossed the ship as if it were made of paper. We swayed violently, the hull creaking under the impact of the colossal wave. I clung tightly to the edge of the deck, struggling to maintain balance as the sea roared around us. The whale disappeared into the darkness, leaving behind only the distant echo of its imposing presence. As the ship stabilized, the crew regrouped, our pale and tense faces reflecting the shock of the encounter. The captain remained on the deck, his expression grim as he reassessed the damage. Is everybody all right? he asked. We nodded, as still stunned by the impact of the wave. I rose from the deck, my limbs trembling with the adrenaline that still pulsed through my veins. What was that? I asked, my voice faltering. The captain shook his head, his eyes fixed on the horizon. I don't know but I have a feeling that we just witnessed only the beginning. As the crew recovered from the shock of the encounter, a persistent sense of unease lingered in the air. I looked out to the horizon to the dark and impenetrable waters stretching into infinity. Now the sea's agitation was only inertia and so little time passed and it was already calming down. A silence settled in, not a safe one, but a heavy and deep silence. There were no birds and no sign of movement. It was as if the sea itself had died. The captain gathered at the crew on the deck, his expression serious and determined, reflecting the urgency of everything. Listen up. Whatever that was, we cannot afford to underestimate it. We're facing something unknown and we need to remain vigilant. We must stay together, work as a team, and be ready to act at any moment. If there are more encounters like this, we need to be prepared. And so our work continued, but now with an added sense of urgency and caution that was not present before. Everything was calculated, every gaze attentive to the horizon in search of any sign of imminent danger. As the hours dragged down, the attention on board only grew. Every sound of the sea kept us on high alert. Every shadow in the fog made us hold our breath. I found myself constantly looking out to the sea, searching for any sign of a suspicious activity. As the night progressed, the fog seemed to become even denser, enveloping the ship in an oppressive curtain of darkness. I found myself trembling with anticipation, waiting for the next encounter with that mysterious creature that had left us so disturbed. 
But finally as dawn began to paint the sky with a shades of pink and orange, a kind of collective relief seemed to spread among the crew. It seemed that the threat was dissipating along with the darkness, and gradually the men fell asleep, exhausted from the fatigue and tension faced. I was one of them, I fell into my bed worn out. It must have been no more than an hour when we were all awakened. A huge bang echoed throughout the entire ship, something hitting the hull with all of its force. I jumped out of bed with the sound, running outside and joining many others who were doing the same. As I reached the bow, I saw the large and familiar face of the whale emerge. We recoiled and alert cries sounded, but then suddenly we realized one thing. It wasn't a normal movement. The thing was static, just floating. It was dead. Its body slowly rotated until it floated on its side and definitely this was the worst part. Its body exhibited a giant bite mark on the side, taking up almost half of it. Some more fervent men began to pray. Captain, Tim shouted, oh, what could have done this? The men did not respond, leaving the question hanging. Oh, we need to go down to investigate, one of the men said. We can use the lifeboat and lower it down. And who's going to go down, you? Another retorted. What me know, I just gave the idea. The debate intensified among the crew members, each expressing their concerns and cowardice in the face of the mission. Meanwhile, the body of the whale continued to float beside the ship, a silent witness to our intrigues. The captain remained quiet, his expression serious and focused as he thought about what to do. He knew that he needed to make a quick and assertive decision to ensure the safety of the crew and to understand what had happened to the whale. But I couldn't wait any longer. No, it's decided, I shouted, everybody falling silent at the unexpected statement. I'll lead the investigation team, prepare the lifeboat. The crew stared at me for a moment, but soon moved quickly, preparing the boat and gathering the necessary supplies for the trip. The captain nodded at me as I descended, his face now showing respect. And don't hesitate to come back if things get tough down there, son, he said as he slowly released the pulley robe. As we descended, Tim and I down the side of the ship towards the lifeboat, the whale's body remained by our side. The dark and impenetrable water of the ocean stretched before us, a sight that made my stomach twist with anxiety. Once the boat was launched into the sea, we embarked, quickly rowing towards the whale's body. The air was heavy with tense silence, only the sound of the oars cutting through the water breaking the morning stillness. As we approached it, the captain raised a pair of binoculars examining the body with a serious expression. Approach with caution, he ordered, his voice filled with authority. As we drew closer, a growing sense of horror took a hold of me. The wound on the animal's side was enormous a grotesque monstrosity that seemed to have been caused by an incredible force. Fragments of flesh and blood floated in the water around the whale, silent witnesses to the violence of the attack. My God, what could have done this? I murmured. And Tim remained silent, his tense expression as he surveyed the scene before us. Carefully, we examined the marks further, searching for any clues that could give us a sign of what had actually done this. But as we investigated carefully, one of the men ran across the deck. Captain, there's something in the water, there's something in the water. I mean, of course there is, look at that body, he pointed to the well. No, Captain, there's something behind it, something bigger. Those words froze my blood. My gaze was slowly led through the large slain animal looking through the hole in its body and at the bottom of that tunnel of flesh beyond the deep and dark waters. I saw an eye, a single gigantic eye staring at me. I trembled in despair, my nerves now tense. I couldn't shout anything to Tim, poor guy, I just started rowing frantically, leading us closer to the boat but that's when it reacted. Its eye blinked and then shadows began to spread beneath the water. We were almost there when a large tentacle tip emerged, 
almost like a hand, the size of our boat or maybe even a little larger rising to strike. And my heart raced as I rowed with all my strength, my body pulsing with adrenaline as I tried to get us away from that imminent danger. The tentacle stretched towards us, its sharp tip cutting through the air with frightening speed. I shouted for Tim to duck, but it was too late. The tentacle struck the boat with force, throwing us out as the impact reverberated through the water. We fell into the icy water, the shock stealing the air from my lungs as I struggled to get to the surface. The sea was murky with the blood of the dead whale, reduced visibility making it impossible to see what was around us. I fought desperately to orient myself and my senses were alert for any sign of danger. But finally, I made it back to the surface, coughing and gasping as I tried to catch my breath. I looked around frantically, searching for support. I saw Tim already hanging onto the rope, reaching out his hand to me, which I desperately grabbed. The boat was overturned, drifting in the water, and the sinister shadow of the tentacle still loomed over it, squeezing it until it sank to the bottom with an impressive speed. A few seconds later, the whale did the same, pulled with tremendous force, disappearing as its blood stained the path to the depths. We quickly reached the top of the ship, pulled by the men who urged us on. After a brief conversation, we never touched on the subject again. The rest of our days were spent in silence on the matter, and no one spoke more than necessary. Perhaps the only time this pattern was broken was one night where I was in my cabin and I heard a knock on the door. Uh, come in, I said. The captain entered as serious as always, closing the door behind him. It reached us because of the container, he said dryly. What? You know it's part of the contract not to touch the cargo, right? He asked, already knowing where this was going. I know, don't worry, I won't say anything. We walked through the dim and empty corridors of the ship, the sea waves now regular, some birds singing in the distance while the moon cast its shadow on the sea. We reached the container where he looked around, searching for any sign of somebody watching us. Finding a negative answer to this, he carefully opened it and we entered. Inside the container, the atmosphere was stuffy and tense. The dim light of a lantern swayed, casting distorted shadows on the metal walls. The smell of mold and sea salt permeated the air, mixing with the metallic odor of the container. In the center, a large tank of dark waters. The captain advanced and I followed closely, my heart pounding in my chest as I prepared for whatever we might find inside. It was then that we spotted something in the dark corner in the water a sinister and menacing shape writhing. My stomach churned when I realized what it was, the creature that had attacked the whale. It was much smaller than the monster that we faced, but it still possessed an imposing presence, its tentacles undulating threateningly. The captain approached slowly, his expression grim as he observed the creature intently. I stayed behind him, my breath caught in my throat as I waited to see what would happen next. This is how it all started. The captain murmured, his voice heavy with regret. With a simple offspring. What are we going to do? I asked, my voice almost a whisper. The captain remained silent for a moment, his eyes fixed on the creature before us. We're going to seal this here, he said finally his voice firm and determined. No one else should know about this. I nodded and we never touched on the subject again and I hadn't shared it with anyone. A few days later, we arrived at the port where some government men received the cargo. I don't know what they wanted with it, but I definitely don't work for them anymore. However, I'm still in the maritime business. You know how it is. I spent most of my life as a sailor, but now more cautiously. Sometimes when I'm traveling in a very dark and rough sea, I still remember that thing, its sinister gaze and the marks left on the whale. I wonder what else might be hidden in the depths of the ocean, beyond our understanding. If I'm alive today, I can only credit that to two things. 
a lot of luck and what I believe to be the assistance of some entity. Either way, let my story serve as a warning to those who wish to explore and venture into inhospitable places. The natural and nature are not the same thing, and the latter is much broader and more dangerous than the former. June 4th, 2023 My heart was filled with anticipation as I boarded the well-polished wooden catamaran illuminated by the morning sun. Around me, the other tourists shared the same feeling, eager to explore the natural beauty of the region and immerse themselves in the culture. Some families with their children held the kids back from getting too close to the edge, while what I assumed to be a group of elderly travelers took photos in the sun and shared stories from younger days. I couldn't help but smile. For a long time, I wanted to travel the world. A boy from Inland California, more specifically from San Bernardino County, now had more passport stamps than fingers on his hands. Attracted by the tropical climate and inviting tourism, I came to explore the bed of the San Francisco River near the village of Del Miro Govea. The local cuisine was appetizing and shortly after walking through the streets, venturing a little out of town, I saw a sailboat in a small makeshift port accompanied by its captain, a man in a blue flannel, shirt boots, and loose pants. He was sturdy, although he appeared to be around 50 years old. His hair had ends that stood up, and he sported a beard as if he hadn't seen a razor for a few days. He was shouting something that I didn't understand, and when I approached him speaking, he quickly switched to English, which, although functional, carried a strong accent. Captain Joao, a tact-turned man with penetrating eyes while talking a bit about his work, guiding tourists along the river, told me various adventures and some local legends. I've always been fascinated by folklore, so being able to hear firsthand about different creatures, like the Isaki, a one-legged black youngster who plays pranks on others, or the pink river dolphin, a river dolphin that turns into a man to court woman, turned out to be one of the highlights of the conversation, so much so that I joined the other crew members who were gathering as we talked. The catamaran glided smoothly through the water, cutting the river with grace and elegance. The cool breeze caressed my face as I watched the bank slowly recede giving way to a lush and exotic landscape. The leafy trees leaned over the water, their canopies swaying gently to the rhythm of the wind. The sun shone brightly in the blue sky, painting the scene with golden hues and vibrant greens. The gentle sound of water lapping against the catamaran's hull was accompanied by the singing of birds and the distant buzz of insects. The fresh aroma of tropical vegetation filled my senses, mingling with the sweet smell of the river. Tourists gathered on the deck admiring the natural beauty around them. Children exclaimed at every sight, Look mama monkey, or look a toucan, while the older ones traded looks of admiration at the majesty of nature. At every bend in the river, a new breathtaking view filled our eyes with as something that I can't describe with words. It was as if we were sailing in an enchanted world, where time seemed to slow down and the beauty of nature revealed itself in all its glory. The sun nestled on the horizon right in front of our boat, painting the waters with shades of yellow and orange. The captain had previously commented on how taking this tour in the afternoon was better as it provided a beautiful sunset, and at that moment I had to agree. I still remember the landscape to this day, and perhaps that was the last moment of calm before the storm, as we simply glided through the waters, an unusual silence fell upon us. No animals made their usual noises, no birds sang. Even the fish abundant throughout the journey seemed to have retreated into their burrows. Uh, there must be a predator nearby, maybe a jaguar, a snake, or an alligator. Joao commented, making some children run into their parents' arms. Hey, don't worry, just stay in the boat and they won't harm us. In the middle of this sentence, a shiver ran down my spine as my eyes fixed on something strange floating downstream. Initially, I thought it was just a log or branches, but as we got closer, 
An uncomfortable sensation came over me, and I drew the captain's attention by pointing with my finger. There was a dead animal floating in the water. I could swear that it was a horse, but something was wrong. My god, a poor thing. I heard somebody comment as they saw the animal. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon to happen, and Joao lamented, slowing down the speed. Some horses get lost in the shallow bed of the river and end up here by accident, too weak to return. Usually, we notify the owner. Let's get a little closer to see the mark engraved on it, to know whose it is. Any objections from anyone? Nobody said anything, but I heard some elderly murmuring in the background. As we approached, the something wrong feeling began to grow within me. That horse, I don't know, it was large and small and it was a disproportionate. Maybe it had swollen due to the water. Maybe been eaten in parts by something. Before I could fully process what I was seeing, the animal sank rapidly, as if pulled by something strong at the bottom, almost like an anchor. While my heart beat uncontrollably with the sudden and unpredictable movement, the boat began to shake forcefully, making a perpendicular and sharply angled movement, almost tipping the catamaran completely sideways. I instinctively grabbed one of the boat's side rails while I saw the captain making the sign of the cross, murmuring words that I didn't understand at the time. Something like, Baklo de Gu. I asked him what had happened. Uh, must have been the rains caught on a rock and the tension of the current caused the effect. He said, clearly uncomfortable. I think it was a unique experience to finish our ride, right? He improved his tone, more excited speaking to the audience. However, the moment those words left his lips, they were accompanied by a nearby thunderclap. People stirred and a few minutes later, a light drizzle began to fall gradually intensifying into a torrential rain, whose drops beat strongly on the boat's awning, and when they fell into the water, created waves with their impact. The crew's unease increased as the captain tried in vain to calm us down, while some lightning struck at a certain distance illuminating the skies. The current slowly began to take control of us, pushing the boat to one side and displacing us towards some rocky formations. The captain tried to take control with the rudder, but his efforts were wasted. We were gaining speed and getting too close to the rocks. There was no way out, and I could only brace myself for the impact moments before feeling the shock reverberate through the ship, along with the dry and hard sound of the stone. By some miracle, the hull hadn't split. Yet, the abrupt impact directed us to the other side with equal intensity, repeating the same process, this time mirrored. We zigzagged like this three times until finally the bow broke apart. The screams of the crowd grew louder as they struggled to grab the buoys and life jackets on the side of the boat. Harsh shoves and trampled people became the modus operandi as the captain fought to regain control of his boat. As if by a miracle, we saw through the mist a small copper-colored mound approaching. Oh, thank God, the captain shouted, staring us there. The river water was already touching our shins when we docked on the island. We disembarked, exhausted and sore from the confusion and the stress. Well, this is a river island, the captain said, still in his tour guide spirit. Strange that it shouldn't be here, not at this time of year. Indeed, the weather is not doing well at all. He sat on a rock. Are we just going to stay here? I asked. With this rain, there's nothing else to do. He said and pulled a radio communicator from his pocket, raising the antenna as static sounded. He turned the knobs for a moment, waited and repeated the movements. Just static. And I think the storm is causing interference too. We'll stay here and wait it out and go in search of help, okay? He stood up, now more assertive. Women elderly and children seek shelter under the trees. Men, help me here, he called us. With some stumps, hollow logs, and large palm leaves, we managed, albeit with difficulty, to build a small shelter. Although it was uncomfortable with the wet clothes against our skin, there was still the comfort of the small fire resting in the center of the makeshift hut. However, the relief was only momentary. 
The feeling of unease only grew as our ears got used to the roar of the rain. Strange noises echoed in the jungle like sinister whispers. Was it an animal? I don't know, it didn't seem like it, although on this trip, I had heard sounds that didn't seem like animals either. Like the song of the Uritau, or the crying of a maned wolf. The captain warned us not to venture too far from the shore, warning about some predators that might be lurking. His eyes seemed to search for movement in the jungle at all times, restless and agitated. As the rain continued to fall relentlessly upon us, the shelter began to give way under the weight of the storm. The wind howled furiously, tearing pieces of palm leaves and knocking down the stumps that supported our fragile protection. And grim cries of alarm echoed among us as we struggled to keep our only refuge standing, but it was a lost battle. With a deafening crash, the shelter collapsed around us, leaving us exposed to the storm that now soaked us once again. Drenched to the bone, we huddled in the rain, seeking shelter in the nearby trees as the storm roared even louder. The sound of thunder rumbled in the air, accompanied by the deafening noise of the water pooling around us. My feet ached as puddles formed inside my shoes. I would likely catch a cold soon. About an hour, perhaps a little more, passed until the rain gradually subsided, leaving behind a sky tinted with soft shades of orange and pink, now with the sun practically invisible to us. The first stars began to shine and the atmosphere among us remained tense and anxious. With the last daylight fading, hope of rescue wilted like our clothes, limp, shrunken, and heavy, replaced by growing concern for our lives. The radio remained silent, unable to penetrate the dense vegetation of the island and reach a signal. With frustration weighing heavily upon us, the captain made the decision to explore the island in search of higher ground to try and re-establish communication, perhaps, as he said, find a natural bridge to the mainland. While he and one of the crew members, a local resident named Severino, who had volunteered to set off into the dense forest, the rest of us anxiously waited on the beach, gathered in small groups exchanging worried murmurs. Some busied themselves trying to salvage luggage from the boat, in vain while others attempted to rebuild shelters weekly. Children cried as mothers tried to calm them. Time dragged us slowly as we waited for the duo's return. Hours passed and anxiety grew with each moment that they didn't return. We were worried and almost forming a group to go and check on them when, amidst the shadows lengthening across the beach, we spotted a solitary figure emerging from the forest. It was the captain, but something was wrong. His steps were hesitant and his gaze seemed to oscillate between each of us with every stride. He appeared increasingly worried. We ran to meet him, doubt swirling in our minds. Captain, where is Severino? Somebody asked as he approached. The captain looked around as if about to say the same thing. He's not here, he asked confused. We were walking for a while when a loud noise interrupted. I ran to see what it was but found nothing. When I turned back, he was no longer behind me. His voice was filled with confusion. I thought that he might have gotten scared and run back here. A shiver ran down the spine of all of us as we absorbed his words. With night rapidly approaching, the danger also increased. Hunger, cold, and a potential predator were fortifying, and we had to think of something quickly. A heated discussion ensued about what to do next. Some suggested staying on the beach and waiting for rescue while others proposed a search to find Severino. Arguments for and against each option flew through the air, each expressing their concerns and viewpoints, the tone escalating with each rebuttal. We should stick together, it's safer, a mother argued, still holding her little daughter in her arms. But what if Severino's in danger, a man, a friend of the missing man, countered? It's too risky to go out at night. Why don't we wait until the morning? A third person murmured, trying to mediate. The discussion intensified and the captain remained silent, oblivious to what was happening. His eyes were fixed on the dark horizon as if searching for an answer within himself. It was then that I made a decision and I stood up. 
Captain, if you go, I'll go with you. My voice sounded firmer than I had expected. Somebody looked at me intrigued by the recent attitude, but before anybody else could intervene, an older gentleman rose beside me. I will go too, his voice calm and resolute. He was a local certainly, but he had perfect English. Two are better than one, and it's best not to leave the captain and you to face this alone. With doubled caution, we set off towards the dense vegetation, our cautious steps echoing on the damp sand of the beach, gradually replaced by a denser sediment. The night enveloped the island like a dark cloak, and the air was heavy with palpable humidity, leaving a taste of saltiness in my mouth. Our sensitive ears marked each sound as a potential threat. Only the distant sound of the persistent rain somewhere far away in the whisper of leaves under our feet broke the silence of the night. We soon approached the place where the captain had heard the noise earlier. To our surprise, there was nothing but the silence of the night. I wasn't much of a believer in energies and auras, but that place definitely gave off a bad feeling. We decided to not stay put for long, and after a brief inspection, we continued our march now with more haste. Not far from there, we reached a clearing where the vegetation opened up to reveal a serene lake, bathed in the pearly light of the full moon. The waters shimmered with a crystal blue hue, emanating this time an intoxicating, calm, and almost hypnotic aura. We stood in silence for a moment, marveling at the beauty of the scene before us until a wet bubbling sound snapped us out of our trance. It was something in the water emerging. It was Severino. He was floating, seemingly unconscious. His clothes seemed to create air pockets that kept him safe. Severino, we've come to get you. Are you alright? The man remained quiet. I'm coming over there. The captain took a step, but soon the hand of our older companion stood in front of him. He signaled for us to wait. In total silence, he picked up a stone, approached a few steps from the lake, and threw it near the floating body. My heart pounded harder even before the stone hit the water. I knew what was going to happen. I had seen it before, and it was the same sense of threat. Just like the horse's body, Severino disappeared into the depths of the lake, being pulled violently and forcefully downward. The captain and I were startled. What the devil is this? I asked. The captain seemed pale, unable to respond, but with a monotone, serious, grave voice, our companion told us, It's the Cablico de Agua. The captain made the sign of the cross again. The water bubbled and the creature emerged, moving slowly towards the shore of the lake. We were astonished by the sight of it. Its humanoid body was wrapped in scaly, copper-toned skin, shimmering in the light. Its form was distorted, almost like a grotesque amalgam of man and fish, with elongated muscular limbs ending in sharp claws that glistened with the cold glow of the lake. I could barely believe what my eyes saw, and my mind refused to accept that it could be real. It was as if my mind was being flooded by a dense fog. I was incapacitated, subdued, and it was doing that. As the creature approached the shore, I could see its bright eyes fixed on us. Its face was a twisted mask of hunger and pleasure, its thin lips curling into something that for a fish might be the equivalent of a smile, exposing rows of sharp teeth like those of a piranha. A scream of terror tore through the night as the creature lunged at us, surprisingly fast for its size, its claws outstretched. Instinctively, I recoiled, but I watched in horror as one of ours was seized by the creature. It was the captain. The monster had grabbed him by his leg. It was possible to see the claws piercing the flesh, causing red leaks over the skin. The man screamed and tried in vain to hold onto some root or stone, but the creature was cunning. There was nothing fixed for him to cling to. The sound of the churning water was accompanied by the agonizing and final screams of the captain as he desperately fought against the creature dragging him down. I felt a wave of nausea and despair wash over me when I realized that there was nothing that we could do to help him, only watch his demise. It was like watching a movie. I didn't even have the perception of the danger that I was also facing. 
until the elderly man had touched my arm. We need to go. I'm sorry about the captain, but you can't mess with these things. His wise gaze seemed to reflect that he had been in such a situation on previous days. Before I could even process what to respond, the creature rose from the lake again, its claws now dripping diluted blood into the water. It turned back towards us, roaring like a wild beast. It was coming for us when something stopped it. A hand from beneath the surface. A broad hand attached to a robust arm. With a freshly made cut covering his left eye, emerging like an animal, it was the captain. He grabbed the monster by the neck and delivered a few blows. It was clear that the creature had been taken by surprise and was being hurt. Run, quickly! Don't worry about me, get the rest of the passengers to safety. The creature had now recovered from the surprise attack and lifted him by the neck. I was pulled by the elder as we ran. The last thing that I saw was the silhouette of the two in the lake. As the captain struggled and struck blows, the creature kept a pressure on his neck. And with a terrible popping sound, the captain's body went limp in its arms. We continued, running through the dense vegetation, the sounds of the night echoing around us. The old man led the way with a grim determination on his wrinkled face. The forest closed in around us. The twisted, tangled branches seemed to try to hinder our progress. I really didn't recognize the path that we had come from. The run was exhausting and we emerged in an open clearing, where these stars cast small fireflies over the damp earth. The man stopped abruptly, his eyes scanning the environment cautiously, and that's when he spotted something at the edge of the clearing, a small rowboat resting peacefully on the sand. This is our chance to escape, he said. Let's go quickly before it's too late. But what about the others? Our best chance is to seek help. The creature must not know about them or it would have attacked already. We ran towards the boat, our hearts racing with renewed hope. As we prepared to depart, our joys were dissipated when a familiar noise echoed from the nearby woods. We looked on in shock as the monster emerged from the shadows, its twisted and sinister form advancing towards us, and it seemed larger now. Blood was not dripping from only its hands, but from its mouth now. It began to run, dropping onto all fours as it closed in. The old man who was still outside of the boat pushed me forcefully into the sea as he remained alone with the creature. The boat carried me out as I watched the monster close in on the man. I couldn't bear to watch, but his screams of pain echoed through the night as I rode frantically, pulling away from the shore as fast as I could. The horrifying sound of flesh being torn and bones breaking haunted my ears. Have you ever heard an older man scream? Cry like a child separated from its mother. While it causes pain, it causes fear. Exhausted and terrified, I rolled until my muscles failed, until I finally fell into a deep and exhausted sleep. When I awoke, I was lying in the sand, the rays of the sun warming my face. In front of me, a team of officers were watching me with expressions of surprise. They began asking questions, but my mind was elsewhere, reliving what had happened the previous night. Hours later, I was at their base, showered and well-fed. With a lump in my throat, I recounted to the officers what had happened on that night. The catamaran shipwreck, the disappearance of the crew, the encounters with that creature and everything. However, my story seemed so surreal and absurd that not even I could believe it, it was true as it came out of my mouth. The officers searched the area for any sign of the river island, the catamaran, or the others. But all that they found were minimal traces that barely supported my narrative. They did indeed have the report of the boat leaving the port. Our trajectory until the rain began, but after that, it was as if it had ceased to exist. Despite the efforts of the authorities, no convincing explanation was found for the events that occurred that night. I was simply released and I returned home as quickly as I could.
Over time, the traumas of that night corroded my sanity. I could no longer sleep without being haunted by nightmares of the river creature emerging from the dark waters to drag me in. Every sound of running water or shadow on the water's surface made me shudder in terror. I no longer went in pools, avoided lakes, and I didn't even go to the beach. I don't use the bathtub anymore and I even try to avoid turning on the tap, preferring to buy bottled water to avoid hearing that sound. My psychiatrist gave me a diagnosis of PTSD saying that I imagined things while delirious on the boat, and I almost believed it, if it weren't for an email that I just received. No sender, no subject, just my name as the recipient and an attachment. A scan of a newspaper page, a newspaper from Del Miro Govia, saying that the boat had been found, and now that it was the right time of the year, it revealed the island, and that along with it, the bodies of over 30 passengers were found. Not drowned, not dead from hunger, but with strange marks on their bodies, attacked by some unidentified animal. <laughs> 